Hello and welcome to another episode of the Popcorn Conspiracy. I'm Dave G. And I'm Kyle. And uh, we're on location again because we're trying to knock over a few episodes because there's so many screenings Mm -hmm. at the moment that we haven't had a chance to get into the studio and record. So we thought what we would do is do a couple in between screenings today. So uh, we're coming live at the moment to you from um, Acme in um, Federation Square in Melbourne. So... Today we are taking a look at Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania, one of the big uh, Marvel movies for this year. Oh, yeah. And the film picks up, and I should say Peyton Reed is directing once again like he has mm-hmm. with the previous Ant-Man films. And uh, this time we find Scott Lang, Paul Rudd, kind of embracing the celebrityhood that comes with being a superhero. He no longer has to pay for coffee in shops and things like that and he's just written a book and people are like lining up to to listen to him read from his book Uh, but then his perfect world comes crashing down when he gets a phone call from um, the county jail to say that his daughter Cassie Catherine Newton has been arrested at a protest now at first he thinks it's just a basic thing but then he realizes that Cassie has actually been experimenting with an Ant-Man suit and that's when a whole bunch of other information um, (laughs) suddenly starts coming to him that he realizes as well Um, his wife Hope uh, played by Evangeline Lilly she's a successful CEO now who's been helping people right around the world but she's got some secrets because she doesn't believe her mother Janet Michelle Pfeiffer has told them everything about the quantum realm since she's returned and Hank um, played by Michael Douglas has his own secrets in that he has been experimenting with ants and has kind of created this super breed of technology technologic savvy ants (laughs) and Of course, the other big secret that comes out is that Cassie has developed a machine that can explore the quantum realm. Now, soon, Cassie is eager to show everybody what she's invented. She turns it on, and within a couple of minutes, they're all sucked into the quantum realm, where they suddenly find out that, yes, in fact, Janet has got a lot of secrets, and they find themselves against um, a few adversaries, including Kang the Conqueror, played by Jonathan Majors. Now, mate, this is one of the big Marvel releases of this year, and um, Marvel, as we know, are trying to get back on track after a couple of uh, films that didn't do so well. What did you think of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania? Yeah, well, this this probably isn't the one to, one to get them back on track. Yeah, I was really quite disappointed in this one. Um, I actually, I was a fan of the other Ant-Man movies. Um, I know that uh, Edgar Wright was originally going to write and direct the very first one uh, before he pulled out, but a lot of his humour remained, and I think that carried over into the first sequel, but none of that is really here. I think, um, sadly, the, the... the story and just really almost everything about this movie is kind of a mess it really is a perfect uh encapsulation of what's wrong with the mcu at the moment where it's just a process line of movies visual effects that really don't look that good and store and just story that doesn't really it doesn't hit you the way that any of the previous movies have and doesn't and it doesn't really give you a reason to care about what's going to come in the future yep um so yeah i was very disappointed in this one what about you david oh look i found this to be what i call a filler film it feels Mm. like it's just a film that marvel will use to to try and get um kang from the loki tv series over into the films um but because there's not much else going on in this film um like this could have almost been a Kang the Conqueror film rather than an Ant-Man film um in a sense and there's so much wasted opportunity with this film and like the the quantum realm when they were there I wanted it to be something different I wanted that experience of like I think you had the same experience as me when I went to see Tron Legacy Mm. and it felt like it did take you to this new world and like everything was um um exciting and i also like the spielberg um movie there's a player one Uh, ready Ready player Player one One. yeah that felt like it took you into a world that you wanted to explore whereas with this one all i kept on thinking when i was in the quantum realm was how much it looked like disney's strange world that came out last year but also 
there were scenes like straight out of um, Star Wars. The cantina scene felt like it was mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. from Star Wars. There was creatures that looked like they belonged in John Carter or, the, or Green Lantern. Um, it just felt like a film where someone had been watching all these movies and went, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I included that or if I included this? Um, Bill Murray is completely wasted in this film. Um, they bring in this character of Lord Kryla, who I thought was going to become, like, a really important character, and then um, he's hardly in it. Like, yeah. it, he's in a couple of scenes and that's it. And, it, yeah, this really, to me, felt like a film that was a filler film to bring Kang into the... Um, the movie part of Marvel, Films, yeah. um, and they could have practically done it with any other su superhero. Like it didn't f even feel like it was a, an Ant Man film as such. Yeah, um, it ver throughout the entire movie, I kept thinking this reminds me so much of Rick and Morty. Yeah, and this was before I realized that the film was written by Jeff Loveness, who is actually a staff writer for Rick and Morty. Yeah. And I know that, like, this series, um, the MCU, this, at the moment, we're, we're dealing with alternate dimensions and all that kind of stuff. And there's going to be some crossover, but I honestly did not know that... I honestly did not know that, that uh, Jeff Loveness was a staff writer in Rick and Morty, but all I could think of when watching this film was that series. They, they've done nothing to they've done nothing to really differentiate themselves from what people know in Rick and Morty. The aliens just feel like Rick and, like, um, Rick and Morty throwaway jokes. Yep. Like, they pass by a character, oh, he looks like he has broccoli for a head, and that's it. Yep. Like, that's the joke. Oh, here's, a, here's an alien that is jelly, that is obsessed with orifices on other species and again all that kind of stuff is something that would exist in rick and morty yeah and it would be okay in that it's not it doesn't fit in this it makes it really brings the at least the ant-man movies down from what the previous films were which was just kind of more ground-based in a way yeah. like they were kind of less um less ridiculous than some of the other than some of the other films uh this one it feels even though it's directed by the same guy that did the other two films it feels very much like it's trying to be a guardians of the galaxy yeah. type movie it's missing all of the supporting characters other than um uh, event, uh hope uh hank and janet from the from the previous movies it's missing all the other supporting characters yeah michael pino yeah, and, yeah. It's, it, him um yeah, and I thought that he, Mike Pena, honestly, was my favorite part about the other movies. Yeah, Even yeah. though he only played like a minor character, I loved his scenes. No Walton Goggins this yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> no Walton Goggins, no, yeah, no, uh, no Janet Greer, no, no supporting characters from the other films, and I, I, it feels like they just didn't want to even bother with them. Like they maybe they read yeah. the script. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, and I mean, I understand that they this is the first movie of phase five and this is as you say this like it really is only a a filler movie that's just um it's basically just to set up kang because yep. that's he's supposed to be the new thanos of at least the the movies going forward and even even that at least personally, I, I think that Jonathan Majors was perhaps the only actor in this movie that was really trying. Yeah. Um, like, Bill Murray looks like he just walked in off the street. It, yeah. And they've chucked a costume on him and started filming. Um, Someone's got some photos. <laughs> yeah. And like, Jonathan Majors, like, he's, he, he at least does seem to be really trying, but I think that he's let down by just how lazy... Like, the, the script feels like it's written on a, on a napkin, like... Yeah, yeah. It, it's just so so lazily done, and, and that this is supposed to be the big springboard for for the upcoming films. I, it's just really disappointing. Yeah, I was going to say, my only pluses or, or positives from this film was Jonathan Majors as Kang. Mm. I think that finally Marvel might have a, um, a villain that we kind of remember, because for once... It, it, like, one of my big... Like, I've, I've always said... DC always create villains that you remember, whereas yeah. Marvel seem to have these throwaway um, villains, which 
in the early days of the um, Marvel Universe, they certainly did, because you would see him in one movie, and then that was it. Thanos was, like, kind of one of the first characters that you saw in multiple ones, but then people still forget who he is, and they're like, oh, yeah, the guy with the gems, like... (laughs) But with Kang, I think Jonathan Majors plays the role so well that you will remember him. The other positive I had was I thought Catherine Newton was okay as Cassie. Hmm. Um, I don't know whether the plan there is to do, like, what they've done with... um, with Hawkeye and a few of the others where you've got people coming in to replace them um, like for when they want to leave but if they did I thought Cassie as a character would actually fit as the new Ant-Man which is kind of ironic because I'm pretty sure they said in the previous ones that the females from that side are always the wasp but yeah anyway I thought Catherine Newton did a great job Um, so yeah, Catherine Newton and Jonathan Majors were my only positives from the entire film, really. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like that was maybe what this movie was trying to set up. Yep. They might have changed that at some point, um, because throughout this movie really does feel like one that's had a lot of um, uh, a lot of rewrites yep. later on. Like there's parts from the movie that are, and I mean you get it a lot with different films, but this is this is a movie that there's there's scenes in this film which are in the trailer almost in their entirety but they're completely different yeah and even the the finale of this this picture really does feel like they're building up to going in one direction yep. and then they got called feet yeah and i th- and i think that might have something to do with maybe because um they've done similar things such as kind of changing maybe changing focus onto different characters and, yeah, yeah. and there's been kind of a bit of blowback to that um but yeah i don't i think that maybe they were trying they were going to do that in this movie and then they just kind of pull, uh, pulled back at the last minute um something that i was really for for a movie like this it really did make me think of uh, tron legacy as well as, as yeah yeah said. but as you say, that that was a movie that the visual effects in that movie were mind blowing. Yeah. Here, it really looked cheap. It, yeah. Like I know people have been saying it for a long time, but this movie, I don't think, I don't think the MCU has ever looked more like um, Robert Rodriguez's Spy Kids films yep. than it does right now. And those are movies that Robert Rodriguez made on the cheap for his kids using his own production his own like visual effects production companies yeah this is like 200 million dollar yeah, movies yeah. here and they look terrible yeah it's amazing how bad some of the things in this movie look there's been a few aussie sci-fis that have come out over the past couple of years where the special effects i felt had lo- actually looked better than this one yeah, so yeah yeah it's kind of weird like that but the other thing i wanted to talk about too was um this whole thing about replacing um, the actors with younger actors, where's that going to end up? Because, of course, we're getting um, a lot of the older actors now wanting to do more. Mm. Like, um, Robert Downey Jr. said recently that he would happily come back and play Tony Stark if he was needed to, like in one of the multiverse movies. Um, You've got Chris Evans basically begging to come back and play (laughs) Captain America. He's actually pitched ideas to Marvel about how to bring back Captain America. So is there this need to replace all of the older actors with younger versions of the same character? I don't think they needed to... I I feel like it's kind of an inevitability that they'll want to do that. But I think... I know a lot of other people have already said, and I kind of agree with them, they really just needed to give us new characters that we were, that we like. They don't... They, they're they not going to succeed by simply trying to find a new version of a new uh, new Captain America, a new... Although I'm happy like, with the new Hawkeye. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, well, that's it. Like, even that, it's a new Hawkeye, new Captain America. You can even tell, like, new Black Panther, new... Iron Man, like you can tell, that's kind of what they're what they're trying to do. But they really needed to give us just new characters, yeah. and and Black Panther is really the only one that they needed. To, yeah, like, yeah, because Pan- of um, yeah. Sid, like what happened to Chadwick Boseman yeah. outside of um, Marvel's, uh, what would you say, outside of Marvel's Their control. control so, yeah, yeah, that's one. That's really the only one, and it's probably one of the only ones that they probably wanted to hold on to. Yeah, too. yeah, um, yeah. It's just. They've had, they've got so many 
decades worth of superhero characters that they could and they they know it they've admitted themselves they've said um that they've got so many like decades and decades of characters and stories that they could that they could uh even the x-men i think a lot of people forget that the x-men are part of the marvel universe yeah that's that's and they've got them now there's enough everything it's like yeah they could do now they could do that but i think that's all stuff that they're that they've got on the back burner they will eventually they are going to eventually have a fantastic four and eventually an x-men movie and all this but it feels like that's down down the line and yeah i think that's there's nothing right now that has anyone's interest like this is now phase five it's to many people shock that phase four is over yeah because and i think that wasn't because anything really happened in phase four wasn't really a it wasn't like any of the other phases where things happened i think they just had so many different movies and tv shows that they had they just swamped the audience for so yeah. many that they just basically had to say okay well that's the end of phase four now we're going to stop phase five yeah. well kevin feige's actually come out in the last week and said that they're not going to do as many marvel tv yeah. shows going forward <laughs> so yeah, yeah. And, and like the silly thing is i thought like especially with the hawkeye series that would have made an exceptional movie if they just hmm. turned like even if you want to do a three-hour film the storyline that ran through that season and Okay, I'm going to say it. This is mm-hmm. going to sound um, very alpha male, but yeah. the violence in that season oh, yeah. um, would have made a really, really good um, movie. Yeah. Like, it probably would have been the best Marvel movie we'd had for a while. But, um, yeah, instead they did it just as an eight-part television series. So Yeah, there's there's been kind of a lot of a lot of odd decisions made in the, in, yeah. in the last two years. So, um, it, it's really like... It, in the previous films you would think in the previous phases in the previous Marvel films you would think oh well I can't wait for this I can't wait for that but yeah it's everyone whenever I hear people talking about it now they're always just saying okay like once they see Guardians of the Galaxy 3 then they're out yeah. you know it's, it's basically like people are just deciding now when to pull the pin yeah. they don't really care that much yeah. which is kind of sad so to wrap up with Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, what are you going to give this one out of five? I'm going to give this two out of five. Uh, it Story-wise, it's so disappointing compared to the other ones, and even just as far as it being just a visual effects uh, spectacle for the eyes, I, I can't stress enough just how bad this movie looks yeah. and how disappointed I was in just all across the board so two out of five for me yeah i'm giving it two and a half out of five but that's mainly because of jonathan majors mm. and Catherine newton's performances and hopefully marvel don't stuff it up with kang because they've yeah. got a good start here so don't stuff it up marvel if there's anyone listening from the marvel <laughs> universe so um but that's it for this episode of the popcorn conspiracy kyle gave ant-man and the wasp quantumania two out of five i gave it two and a half out of five But for now, I've been Dave G. And I've been Kyle. And we'll be back soon with another episode of The Popcorn Conspiracy.